Hey everybody, so recently I received a Mission Engineering Gemini 2 Studio a uh, stereo FRFR monitor from the fine folks over at Mission Engineering. I was very impressed with this speaker, very, very impressed. And I did a, a little overview review video last week about it, and I wanted to do a follow-up video focusing more on one of the, what I feel is the really, really amazing features about this speaker, uh, which is their Empower knob. I talked a little about it in the first video. If you want to go check that out, I'll put the link below. Uh, to kind of give an example, a little overview of it. But I wanted to talk a little bit deeper. I had a great conversation uh, last week-ish, uh, um, with uh, right after I received the speaker, a couple days after when I had a little bit of time with it. I had a great conversation with Paul over at Mission. He's a great guy, uh, really wonderful to talk to, really knows his stuff, and um, gave me some really cool information. I shared some of my thoughts on the speaker with them. And he kind of was just basically confirmed some of the things that I was hearing and thinking. So that was a really nice thing to be able to do to kind of dive into, talk to somebody who was directly, is directly involved with this speaker and the design of it and knows the ins and outs of it. So that was really awesome. So I wanted to talk first, before we dive into the Empower thing, just about some of the issues I get questions a lot about um, concerning people who get some of my patches that I dial in for my Line 6 Helix and use them, um, or people that just say, you know, I'll hear people talking about the monitoring with the FRFR speaker, and some people find it's uh, too bright, some people find it's too dark, some people find they just can't get it to sound like the so-called amp in the room thing we always hear about, right? So. I want to just share a few of my experiences. Way, way back, uh, and this is many, many years ago when I first started playing live, and I was playing through tube amps, which I've I, you know, played through for the vast majority of my playing life. Uh, I bought one of those, I was playing through a combo amp, 212 combo, and I bought one of those amp stands that kind of tilt the amp back. And this is way back, and it was a real eye-opener to me because I always loved the sound of my tube amp on stage. And I thought, man, if I could just get it facing up towards me, this is going to be great. It's going to, you know, maybe I'll be able to bring my stage volume down a bit. Uh, the guys in the band will be happier. It'll sound wonderful. And as soon as I tried it, I all of a sudden hated my tone on stage. And it made me wonder, wh why was this, right? And, and the reasoning is, is all of a sudden, Compared to what I was used to playing, which was an amp, a 212 combo, basically blowing sound past my kneecaps or my pant legs, I'm now faced with this same amp, nothing else changed, tone control is the same, everything, all the settings the same, basically coming up and hitting me right in the face now or in the ears, right? And what, the reason I bring this up is because what most people who are used to playing through normal guitar amps are used to hearing is probably not what's really coming out of their amp, if that makes any sense, right? A guitar speaker is very directional, meaning it throws the sound out um, in a very straight line, for the most part, right? With pretty poor off-axis um, sound, I guess we could call it, right? Meaning what you're hearing coming straight out the front of that is not what you're gonna hear if you stand off to the side of it, or if your ears are elevated above it. It's throwing the sound straight out, and our ears are up here, or our ears are over here and up here, right? So we're going to hear a very filtered and colored sound compared to what's coming off of it. And this can be um, really exemplified by anybody who's done recording, right? We hear our amp in the room, it sounds wonderful. Let's say we grab our, our trusty old SM57 microphone, we throw that on the speaker cabinet, and all of a sudden, when we hear the playback, we go, that's not what my amp sounded like, right? And anybody who knows, if we take an SM57 microphone, put it directly straight on the center of a speaker cone, it's going to sound like nails on a chalkboard in most cases with any overdriven or distorted tones, right? Very piercing, lots of high-end accentuation. So a guitar speaker really we're going to get a different sound of it depending on where our ear is in relation to the speaker because it's so directional. So when I first started playing modelers, I still had tube amps and I was oftentimes running them as a lot of people do through a, a power amp, the power amp section of my tube amp maybe just uh, via the effects uh, loop return uh, in through a guitar uh, cabinet, right? Uh, I think at the time I had a, uh, a, a beautiful cabinet. It was 210, 212 speakers in, in the same configuration. It was amazing. 
but it basically was an easy transition. It's, it's exactly what I was expecting to hear, except, you know, now my preamp section was being, you know, digitally modeled, right? But I wasn't into the world of digitally modeled speaker cabinets or microphones yet. So I was hearing what I wanted to hear. Wonderful. Most people, when playing through a guitar speaker cabinet, don't have their ear right down in that directional area of where the speaker is really blowing that sound out or where we would even put a microphone, right? And this is another thing when playing live. People have their sound on stage and then they, they, if they do hear their rig out in the front of house, it's such a different sound because now it's the sound of where that microphone is placed um, feeding out into the front of house PA system. So. My next move after getting into modeling, I, I used a Kemper profiler for a long time, a very short period with the Atomic Amplifier, both fine devices. Now I've settled, as most people know, that are used to watching my videos on the Line 6 Helix. I've never been happier. I feel it's one of the top modelers out there, it does everything I need it to. Um, but then I moved to a more traditional two-way uh, PA style speaker, right? Two way meaning separate drivers for high frequencies and, and low mids and lows, right? The problem with these again is they're going to have relatively poor on versus off access coloration to the sound. What we're not meaning we're not going to hear the same thing uh, if we stand in different places, right? And again, the reason is most high frequency drivers, oftentimes known as tweeters, right, in, in two way systems, uh, are gonna be much, much more directional, meaning they're gonna throw their sound straight out with less dispersion than say the low frequency driver or the mid frequency driver, which is going to kind of be heard and felt at a much wider dispersion. So anywhere you're standing, you're gonna get more of those low frequencies, whereas the tweeter or the high frequency driver may shoot the sound straight out. So we're, depending on if we're standing right between those two, we may get a nice balance of both, but as soon as we veer off to the side or we're standing up, uh, not in the line of even where that angled speaker is hitting us, it's going to change the sound. So we're never really hearing an accurate representation of what the sound we dialed in, unless we're perfectly positioned, right? It's much like in a recording studio, where they talk about the sort of equilateral triangle of the studio monitors to the, to the person who's mixing or in the uh, listening position, right? With the tweeters at ear level. That, that's why they talk about it, because it's so directional. So there's really only that one sweet spot where we're gonna hear everything the way that we should, okay? So you start to see this gets a little confusing, but here's the other problem when moving to sort of a traditional PA style, let's call it FRFR, which is supposed to be sort of a flatter frequency response compared to a guitar cab, which is a very filtered sounding speaker, let's say EQ wise, is that now we've introduced another variable into our modeling where we're going to be getting a big portion of our sound from some sort of a speaker cab modeling or and microphone modeling, right? Whether we're using an IR or whether we're using sort of built-in cabs from whatever modeler of choice we have. So, so now all of a sudden what people are hearing, and I think this is where a lot of the problem lies with um, modelers when people come from tube amps is they are not used to hearing the sound of their guitar recorded through a microphone. They're used to hearing it just kind of coming out of their speaker cab. And like I said before, not really hearing that direct sound because our ear is never in the line of what that directional sound is coming off of our speaker cab, right? So that a microphone would pick up. So all of a sudden we hear the sound of this microphone being modeled and we go, that's not what I'm used to hearing either, right? So that, that throws another wrench into it, but now with a traditional two-way PA speaker as our FRFR monitor, we now have this uh, problem of on versus off axis coloration. Plus we're hearing the sound of a modeled um, microphone and speaker cabinet, which is not maybe what we're used to hearing. So you see how the problems start arising here and a lot of folks, it takes them a lot of getting used to, to um, to get comfortable playing through a modeling device, right? So now that brings us to something like the Mission Gemini, which is a really brilliant design because it's more of what we call, or it is what we call a coaxial speaker design where the high frequency and low frequency drivers are aligned. So the high frequency driver is, is positioned in the center of the low frequency driver and we basically get more of we basically get a much better on and off access sound now because no matter where we move, 
that sound is dispersing, and these speakers are designed to disperse the sound out to a much wider area. So regardless of where we're standing, um, whether we're, our, our ears are positioned above the speaker, off to the sides, that is dispersing the sound. I believe Paul told me there was an 87 degree pattern of dispersion from these speakers is how they designed it. So it's really, no and, and I can really, um, uh, attest to this too in the room with the Mission Gemini, no matter where you moved around, said you're getting the same sound. Now that's an amazing feature, it's wonderful. But here's the problem. If somebody gets that and they are not used to the sound of a modeled guitar amplifier, speaker cabinet, and microphone, that could actually be a downfall and they could actually maybe not even like this speaker because now they're hearing something that they're not used to hearing, isn't the sound they were expecting, and there's no escape from it because on and off axis, they're hearing the same sound. So go back to a traditional two-way speaker, um, you know, a PA style speaker that we're using for an FR, FR. If we're hearing that accentuated high end maybe and something kind of more abrasive than what we're using, we can, than what we're used to hearing, we could at least move off access. And I found when I was using that, just not standing right directly in front of the speaker kind of solved the problem and gave me more of that so-called amp in the room sound because the off access was taming the high frequencies much like a guitar speaker would. So interesting um, that this wonderful feature of something like the Mission Gemini could also be something that turns people off of it. And it's not the fault of the speaker. It is more the idea that number one, a lot of folks are not used to hearing what's coming out of these because they're not used to hearing their tube amp recorded through a microphone and played back to them, which is essentially what these modelers are doing, right? So I hope that's kind of sort of clear so far. Um, so, we then say, well, what's the solution to this? Well, this is bringing us to the point of this video and something that I think uh, Mission was just uh, brilliant as far as implementing this feature into the Gemini. Um, obviously, uh, we could get used to just simply dialing our tones out of our modeler to um, these new speaker systems, right? Um, and maybe darken them up a bit. I've been a big proponent of dialing in tones that are slightly darker uh, to the darker side rather than the bright side just because of this, right? And then when we get the stage volume and crank them up, we're not getting that piercing sound. So there is that. We want to be able to dial our sounds in properly. But at the same time, my first impression with the Gemini was that, that, that tones that I had dialed in on my studio monitors that sounded great and also when I'd play back the YouTube video through sets of headphones or on my stereo system at home, it translated very nicely. So I was thinking, well, this is, this is great. This is sounding really good. But I found that those same patches when I plugged into the Gemini were a little bit brighter and not quite what I was used to. So I thought, that's interesting. So I talked to Paul about this as well. Now, with the empower knob on the Gemini, I explained it in my first video, but what it basically does is it has two settings, flat and cab, okay? And it's just a knob, right? And we can go to whatever setting between the two we desire. So in talking to Paul about having the empower knob set on flat, he explained to me that Mission actually really went out of their way to design the Gemini in a way that it is going to be as flat as they could possibly get it out into a very sort of extended frequency range, probably more so than a lot of the speakers that are um, made by other companies, right? Where maybe they're tailoring it more towards just always sounding like a guitar, more towards maybe a guitar speaker would. Now the reasoning behind this made a lot of sense to me when he said it. He says, well, you know, you and I may be thinking of this as strictly for use with an electric guitar, but what's stopping somebody with an acoustic guitar who's also using maybe a Line 6 Helix to set up a beautiful acoustic patch to process it with EQs and reverbs and compression and, and whatnot, and they wouldn't want to plug into an FRFR speaker that maybe didn't have that extended flat response, right? Up into the higher range where, you know, a lot of electric guitar frequencies don't live up there. And that's the brilliance of the empower knob, right? If we have a patch 
uh, that we've dialed in elsewhere on a set of monitors like I would with my studio monitors where maybe I'm not always listening on axis, right? Maybe I'm a little off axis and I'm getting a little bit of a darker sound and all of a sudden I bring it over to the Gemini. Yeah, when it's set to flat because of the coaxial design and the, um, the on and off axis lack of coloration for, for lack of a better term, um, you know, all of a sudden maybe that same patch because I'm finally hearing it in a much more accurate setting is going to translate as being a little bit brighter. Well, we grab the empower knob and we turn it and that solves our problem. So very smart move of the folks at Mission to design it in a way that they made it as flat as possible over as broad a ra uh, frequency range as they did. I'm gonna give you guys some sound examples very shortly. I hope I'm not going to, on too long winded here, but I just wanted to talk about this before we get into the sound examples. Um, what Paul had mentioned to me, and it really went along with my findings as well. I found that if I took patches I dialed in on my studio monitors, and took the empower knob and moved it anywhere from 65, 70, 75, 80%, somewhere let's say in the 70 to 80%, depending on the patch, but somewhere in the 70 to 80%, even maybe let's settle on 75% of the way, um, that, that being closer to the flat setting, it really recreated the patch in the way that I heard it coming out of my studio monitors, but except in a much better coaxial design where I'm gonna have far better on and off access colorations or lack of coloration is probably a better term. Meaning, no matter where I stand in relation to this, I'm gonna get the sound of the patch the way that I remember it, the way that I dialed it in, which is just amazing. Plus, if we're in a venue where maybe we don't have a PA and we're relying on uh, something like the Mission Gemini or our monitoring system to, to throw the sound out to the audience, it's not just gonna be the people sitting in the front row directly in front of our guitar speaker that are, are getting hit with you know, the direct sound of the guitar. Everybody else is getting sort of an off axis sound. This is gonna disperse that sound so everybody in the audience is going to hear what we dialed the sound in as and also what we are hearing on stage, which is amazing. What a great feature, okay. So the empower knob, let's get back to that then. I hope I've explained, sorry, I hope I've explained all of that clearly. If not, leave me some comments. I'd love to discuss it further with you. And these are all just sort of my opinions and takeaways with this. So, um, so like I said, Paul kind of further um, clarified that with me that they found the same thing. They would basically dial in their patch, bring the empower knob back to around 80, 75%, um, you know, towards the flat side and that's the greatest, you know, that that's the, the perfect spot for it to sort of recreate what we're used to hearing. So that's an amazing feature, I think. Really big congrats to the folks at Admission for adding that feature in. So very, very impressed with it. Um, it also, the danger of it, and the reason I want to make this video is I think some folks may look at it and see, you know, how there is a cab setting all the way to the other side and say, oh good, I want it to sound like a guitar cab, yoink. You know, and they, they, they bring it all the way to the cab sound and it's gonna sound extremely dark. So you might say, well, why did Mission even put it to that extreme? Well, you never know. I mean, why not, right? We don't have to move it there. Uh, maybe somebody dialed in an excessively bright tone that's really a problem, or maybe we're forced into using that because somebody else dialed in our tone for a particular situation. Who knows? We're into all sorts of different situations sometimes in live playing. It gives us that option to be able to go all the way if we want, but nobody's saying we have to, right? I think for most situations where we have a, a well dialed in patch, we're going, and depending on our scenario live, we're going to end up using that empower knob either set to full flat or somewhere before halfway. Halfway is starting to get pretty dark. So I would say even up maybe at the most 60% of the way, you know, heading more towards the flat side of things. So hopefully that all makes sense. So let's hear how it actually sounds with a few examples. Okay, so what I've done is I've dialed in a patch on my Line 6 Helix uh, based off of the Placator Dirty model. <clears throat> um, just so we can hear what this sounds like with some distorted tones, which is gonna be, I think, a better um, uh, example of how this Empower uh, knob can work. Um, I've mic'd it with the virtual uh, SM57 one inch away, trying to get kind of that, you know, edgier, brighter style tone. And it's on, I believe, the Greenback 25 cabinet within the Line 6 Helix, okay? Right now, I have the Mission speaker set on full flat response uh, for the Empower knob. So that's what this would sound like. And what you're hearing here, it's not ideal, again, like I mentioned in the first video. I have a, um, 
A Sterling Audio ST151 large diaphragm condenser miking the Mission Gemini. Obviously, it's not gonna sound the same way as it does in the room, but you know we're gonna keep that same mic, same positioning for all the settings, so at least it'll be a relative uh, comparison of the different sounds. So here is the patch set to full flat on the empower knob. <laughs> Okay, so um, again, you know, we really don't have anything to compare that to because you can't, you haven't heard the original patch as I dialed it in. So here again is a guitar riff played with um, the the Mission Engineering and Power Switch knob totally on flat. <laughs> Now let's take a listen to it. If we dial it back to about 75%, and this is the area in my discussion with Paul and in my own findings, I found that this got the cabinet closer to the sound of what I was hearing off of my studio monitors and what we would kind of expect more from hearing that maybe sort of amp in the room type sound people are used to hearing, right? So it's a really wonderful solution. We've got this coaxial design, like I mentioned before, it's giving us beautiful dispersion off and on access uh, sound. And we're able to now mimic more like what we would hear from a guitar cab. So let's take a listen to that same riff, but we're gonna play it with the empower knob at 75% being closer to the flat side. <laughs> So what I'm going to do after the fact too is I'm going to edit these uh, different sound files together um, so you can hear them right back to back after we discuss this. So you can hear how the subtle changes are there between the different settings and I'll label the different settings on the screen as well just so you can hear them without the dialogue in between. Um, I would also encourage you to listen on some decent headphones or a decent stereo system uh, just so you can hear the subtle changes between the different settings. Okay, let's now move it. I'm going to do a couple more. Let's move it so that it's not around 75%, but maybe more around 60-65%, uh, probably closer to 60%, and then I'll do another one that is with the dial at noon or set to 50% so you can compare all of these, okay? <laughs> Okay, so there's all the examples. Let me now edit those all together back to back so you can kind of hear them more seamlessly and be able to maybe jump between them to hear uh, the subtle changes between the empower knob settings and I'll put on the screen the settings that you're hearing, okay? <laughs> think of that I, it's it's a very it's a very difficult thing like I said before to get this to come across in a video because you're not in the room with it and you really need to be in the room with it to get full effect and full feel of what this is like to play through 
Um, because we, you know, we're miking it, that's adding another filter in there. And, but at least it's the same mic, same positioning, same uh, volume levels and everything as well. So you are hearing a relative change between those settings, which is really the important thing to sort of know what that knob does. So like I said, I think is one of the most important features uh, that, that Mission decided to put into the Gemini to really allow us to get that amp in a room sound. Here I have it set now finally where I kind of like it. And this is right around, I would say, 65 to 70% closer to the flat setting. And I find that that kind of gives me the sound that I want that's very similar to how I dialed it in on my studio monitors and my headphones in the studio. And again, depending, you know, it, the beautiful thing about it is it's just a knob we could turn it to wherever we want. I might get into a live situation with this and go, well, no, that's too dark and just peel it back a little bit more. Or maybe it's still too bright depending on the situation. But the beautiful part about it is we don't have to dive through a bunch of menus or tweak our tones at our Helix or our modeler of choice. <clears throat> we simply have a knob we can simply grab and in about one second, uh, peel it back or, or, or bump it up a bit to get the sound that we want. So here's the sound of that same patch where I would probably set it and where I kind of like it, right? <laughs> All right, so I hope that helps some folks and I hope it answered a few questions concerning some of the confusion between not only what modelers are really doing and why some people have a hard time kind of uh, adjusting to it, but also to how the different monitoring systems we can use depending on whether we're using a guitar cap, real guitar cabinet with a power amp, or a two-way or three-way PA style system, or a coaxial design like the Mission Engineering speaker, which really to me seems like the, the, the optimum choice, the optimal choice. It is um, so wonderful because of the on and off access um, sound of it being so accurate, right? But throw in something like the Empower knob and it's going to fix any potential issues that any folks might have with not being used to hearing the sound of their guitar amp mic'd and played back to them, right? So it was a really real stroke of genius as far as I'm concerned for Mission Engineering to include the Empower knob and a big, big uh, tip of the hat to them for doing that. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I hope it was of some help. Um, I hope what I was saying made sense and I explained it in a clear way. If not, you know, send me a message uh, or leave me a comment below. I'm always happy to discuss these things. Um, and again, you know, some of these things are, are the way I see things in my opinion and others might view things differently. And as I always say, you know, so um, take it for take it for what it's worth and with a grain of salt. So uh, thanks so much for tuning in, guys. I'll be back very soon with some more content and uh, some more uh, videos even about the uh, wonderful Mission Engineering Gemini speaker with some of the other features, uh, such as the uh, really what's a great feature, the USB audio interface that's built right into it. So we'll talk a little bit about that in the future, okay? So thanks again for tuning in, guys. Really appreciate it, and we will talk very soon. Ciao for now.